So with that, committee staff, if we are ready, I will both go ahead and call the Ways and Means meeting to order. If you could call the roll, please. Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson. Assemblyman Frierson. Here. Assemblywoman Gorlo. Here. Assemblyman Hafen. Here. Assemblywoman Howdigy. Here. Assemblyman Lovett. Here. Assemblywoman Miller. Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno. Here. Assemblywoman Peters. Here. Assemblyman Roberts. Here. Assemblywoman Titus. Here. Assemblywoman Tolls. Here. Assemblyman Watts. Here. Chair Carlton. And I am here. So welcome everyone. We have a number of bills on our agenda this evening. We have a lot of work in front of us just so that everyone understands the uh, kind of the role for this evening. Uh, we have four bills to introduce, which I think that takes us up to about 115 bills right now. Um, when we start the hearings, we're going to start with administration bills. So the committee will start at AB 464 and work through the list from there. And if there are those that we can uh, process tonight, we will. If not, we'll hold on to them to our next meeting. And then we'll come back and we'll work through the list. It's the chair's intention since AB 116 has drawn a lot of attention to have that be the last bill this evening so that all the uh, opposition doesn't slow down uh, everything else that's going on. So that allows us to get through the other bills a little bit better. So with that, we'll go ahead and do the uh, the BDR introductions at this time. I'll let Ms. Kaufman walk us through those, if, if she would please. Thank you, Madam Chair. BDR uh, 431149 is uh, an act relating to the Department of Motor Vehicles, renaming the Division of Management Services and Programs of the Department of Motor Vehicles to the Division of Research and Project Management and provides other matters properly relating thereto. And Ms. Kaufman, if you would just go ahead and read them all and we'll take one motion on all of them. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, the next uh, BDR is S1062. And this is an act making an appropriation to the Millennium Scholarship Trust Fund to support the Governor Gwen Millennium Scholarship Program and providing other matters properly related thereto. And BDR 40-1069 is an act relating to health care, transferring the Patient Protection Commission from the Office of the Governors to the Office of Aging Disability Service, Services Division of the Department of Health and Human Services and provides other matters properly relating thereto. And BDR S-1097 is an act relating to off-highway vehicles, abolishing the revolving account for the, assistance of, for the assistance of the department and providing other matters properly related thereto. So with that, committee members, does anyone have any questions on any of the bill draft introductions at this time? Not seeing any, I'd go ahead and accept a motion to introduce from Ms. Benitez Thompson, second from Assemblywoman Titus. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Hearing no opposition passes unanimously, the members present, we'll report those to the floor and they're gonna get spun right back around to us. So expect to see them on an agenda near you soon. So with that, I believe we can go ahead and begin our business for the evening. We'll begin with Assembly Bill 464. And I have been informed that I have about maybe 40, 50 people in Zoom and on video. So when I call up a bill, if you're the person I need, please speak up. It will help us manage what we're doing. So Assembly Bill 464, I'll have Ms. Kaufman walk through it and then we'll uh, go to the uh, GFO or whoever the designated person for the GFO is this evening. Ms. Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Assembly Bill 464 provides for a general fund appropriation to the stale claims account of $3,570,578 uh, to the emergency account for uh, $239,791 and to the uh, statutory contingency account for $12,051,658 and an appropriation to the contingency account, the amount of 
$305. Thank you very much, Ms. Kaufman. And if you would just walk the committee through the basic purpose behind this bill. This is one that we see every session. It's one of the things that we do to be able to replenish some of these funds. So I'll just have Ms. Kaufman walk you through it real quick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, the, uh, this bill is a replenishment bill. So there are uh, four uh, basic uh, contingency or emergency accounts that require replenishment each year. And uh, this would uh, bring the, uh, the various accounts to uh, a level that is sufficient to uh, meet the needs for the next biennium. Okay, thank you very much. So with that, Ms. Brown, good evening. Welcome to Ways and Means at Dusk. Good evening, Susan Brown, Director of the Governor's Finance Office. And I'm happy to answer any questions or provide any information you need on this particular bill. Okay, committee members, are there any questions of Ms. Brown and or our staff on the replenishment of these different accounts that are in front of you at this time? Not seeing any questions from any committee members. With that, this is the bill hearing for Assembly Bill 464. So I'll go ahead and open up the hearing on 464. Uh, do we have anyone um, here in support of Assembly Bill 464? If you're on Zoom, if you'd wish to be recognized, um, and then we'll go to um, audio. Do we have anyone on Zoom? Not seeing anyone. Broadcast services, could we please go to the audio? To testify in support of AB 464, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the testimony line is open and working. However, we have no one to testify in support of AB 464. And thank you, Broadcast Services. Could we go to those possibly in opposition? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 464, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, testimony line is open and working. However, we have no one to testify in opposition to AB 464. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone in neutral? Is there anyone wishing to testify in neutral on AB 464? Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the testimony line is open and working. However, we have no one to testify in neutral on AB 464. Thank you very much, Broadcast Services. So with that, I don't believe there's any other discussion points or any closing comments that would be need to make. So we'll go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 464. We'll open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 465. Ms. Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Assembly Bill 465 makes an appropriation from the State General Fund of $2,119,308 to the Division of Water Resources for the State Department of Conservation and Natural Resources for the repair and maintenance of the South Fork Dam. Thank you very much. Committee members, are there any questions of Ms. Kaufman at this time? Not seeing any. Ms. Brown, did you have a statement? Susan Brown, for the record, the Division of Water Resources is in the meeting to talk about this bill. Okay. Division of Water Resources, did you have a statement for this evening? Good evening. Yes, thank you, Chair Carlton. This is Adam Sullivan. Uh, we have a uh, acting Nevada State Engineer. We do have a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation to go along with this to discuss this, this bill. You brought a PowerPoint presentation to Ways and Means? We yeah. did. How long is it? It's between five and 10 minutes. A no. 
So if you'd like to just give us a brief overview, please. Um, we understand the issue. Yeah. We've heard about this issue numerous times, and we understand how important and significant the maintenance on the South Fork Dam is. If you've got some nice photos to show us, we'd be more than happy to, to look, but the committee, I don't believe, really needs a 10-minute PowerPoint presentation on the South Fork Dam. Not that we I don't appreciate agree. you going through the work, but we're moving them tonight, so. I understand. Um, again, this is Adam Sullivan, Acting Nevada State Engineer. With me is Micheline Fairbank, Chris Thorson, Deputy Administrators of the Division of Water Resources. So the South Fork Dam, um, it, the problem that we're facing right now is uncontrolled foundational seepage uh, at the toe of the dam. Um, we're in the process of uh, doing a geotechnical investigation of the pro of the of the uh, mechanism of the of the seepage. However, it's been getting substantially worse over the last few years. Um, and the purpose of this appropriation is to fund the construction costs that would be required to uh, repair the foundational seepage um, based on the outcome of the, of the geotechnical investigation. Um, this is a high hazard dam located in Elko County. Um, it also supports the South Fork Reservoir, which uh, is a state park managed facility as well as an endow fishery. Um, it's uh, the, the, the risk here is potential dam failure. It's, it's a high hazard dam, which would result in a high likelihood of loss of life. Uh, it's a 33 year old structure. It has continued and, and pervasive needs for ongoing maintenance. Uh, the, the division has a base operating budget of $32,000, but most of that goes to the USGS gauging stations upstream and downstream of the reservoir. So we have enough to cover just basic expenses, but any work above the base operating expenses requires an additional appropriation. So with AB 365, we, 465, we, the division believes that we have a duty to request funding for the needed repairs to protect life, property, and the re recreational and economic resource. And if anybody has any questions about the, the condition of the dam or the status of the investigation or the plans for construction, we are available. Thank you. And thank you very much. And I, I was, was jo just joking with you a bit. I didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings for preparing the presentation. Did you submit it to Nellis as an exhibit? Yes, we did. Okay, good. So individual members will be able to review that when, uh, when, when they feel appropriate. So with that, uh, when was the investigation done on the dam? The investigation is, is ongoing. It, it was initiated uh, about two years ago. And um, the, the investigation on site has, has been complete and the, there's current analysis and modeling um, being conducted. And the purpose of that is to, to uh, distinguish the best, most cost-effective construction methods and approach for addressing the, the failure. Okay, thank you very much. I do have a question from Assemblywoman Titus. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you for your presentation, and I'll definitely look it up, uh, the rest of it. Uh, just a quick question. This comes with um, specific dates that it needs to happen by, and I'm wondering if um, your agency, it sounds like you're, you've done your studies. How quick could you do this, and can you fulfill the obligation by um, September of 2023? This is Chris Thorson, Deputy Administrator, for the record. Um, at this time, we're it's too early on in the investigation, um, and we need a little bit more time to be able to um, make sure that we can meet the deadline that's proposed in the BDR. Can I clarify with staff, if, if, would, if they're not able to meet the deadline, would they then come back for an extension, or how would the process be? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So the appropriation within this um, bill uh, allows for the agency to utilize the funds through June 30th, 2023. If uh, their um, 
still needs additional funding or if they haven't utilized the funds, uh, that funding would revert and at which time the 2023 legislature would then be approached uh, for the uh, division to seek an additional appropriation to uh, continue on with the project. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for the question and the clarification uh, from staff because I, I just worried if they're still in the planning stage, um, getting these things started, getting a contractor could be delayed in permits, et cetera. So I'm just um, concerned, but I, hopefully within the two-year process, they'll be able to get this done. Thank you. Thank you. Committee members, any other questions at this time on this issue? Not seeing anyone. Thank you very much to the division. So with that, this is the hearing on Assembly Bill 465. We'll go ahead and open it up. Do we have anyone on um, Zoom wishing to testify on Assembly Bill 465? Not seeing anyone wishing to be recognized. We'll go ahead and go to the audio broadcast services. Could we go to anyone in support of Assembly Bill 465? Anyone wishing to testify in support on AB 465, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no one to testify in support on AB 465. Thank you. If we could open it up to opposition, please. To testify in opposition on AB 465, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no one to testify in opposition on AB 465. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone in neutral, please? If you would wish to testify in neutral on AB 465, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is no one to testify in neutral on AB 465. And thank you very much. I'll go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 465. We will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 466. Ms. Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Assembly Bill 466 makes uh, general fund appropriation of $15,842,433 for hepatitis C treatment for uh, offenders within the Department of Corrections. It also provides for a general fund appropriation of $196,523 for the replacement of medical and dental equipment. Thank you very much, Ms. Kaufman. Uh, do we have someone from the Department of Corrections available? If you'd like to go ahead and proceed, please. Yes. Madam Chair, for the record, this is Russ Alfano, Medical Administrator from the Department of Corrections. I'm here available to answer any questions should they come up. Thank you. Would you just give us a a bit of uh, the hepatitis C issue is, I believe, very familiar with a lot of us that are on this committee, especially those that sat through the interim. Uh, I don't believe we need too much explanation on that one. But if you would go through the uh, replacement medical and dental equipment, just give us a high-level overview of what we're talking about. Yes, ma'am. Uh, for the record, Russ Alfano, Medical Administrator in the Department of Corrections. Um, basically, it's a list of equipment that by usage is, is worn out and uh, beyond its useful life. And we ask that they be replaced so that we can maintain providing care to the inmates in custody. Uh, these things include uh, IV infusion pumps, defibrillators, uh, electrocardiograms, cavitrons for sterilization, uh, digital dental x-ray system to bring us more into the uh, current era, uh, surgical hand pieces, uh, dental suites, elect uh, visual acuity charts, ophthalmolic chair and stands, uh, 
x-ray readers and so forth. Okay, thank you. And I'm assuming that this equipment is spread across all the different institutions across the state? Yes, ma'am, it's statewide replacement. Okay, that's, that's what I thought. We won't ask you what's going where. That's, that's not necessary. So with that, I'll go ahead and open it up to committee members. I know Dr. Titus is gonna have a question, so Dr. Titus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just for clarification, none of this the replacement equipment is um, the ultrasound equipment that's needed prior to treatment of any of these hepatitis C patients? No, ma'am. Um, and so you're still going to outsource that particular need? Uh, for the record, Russ Alfonso Medical Administration, um, we are looking to establish a few um, uh, providers that can provide either in, in, the, in the fences treatment and observation for the ultrasounds or um, through our network for verb provider organization. Uh, again, providers that can see our inmates in a timely fashion. Um, we have not had the ability to shop or acquire uh, pricing yet. Um, that's still in the negotiated works at this time. And, and during our, and thank you for that, and during our subcommittee hearing on, on um, the hep C treatment from the Department of Corrections, it was identified um, how many you were actually going to treat. Will this $15 million then treat all identified cases and all inmates that are um, projected to be treated? Yes, ma'am, there'll be, um, uh, for the record, Russ Alfano, medical administrator. Um, this will be in perpetuity um, going forward. This, the 15 million allocation will, will get us through fiscal year 23 based upon the, uh, the costs we've identified and estimate. Great, thank you. I will uh, treat all the patients. Great, thank you. Thank you for the answers and thank you for the question, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Are there any other questions of any other committee members at this time? Not seeing any, this is the hearing on Assembly Bill 466, so we'll go ahead and open it up. Is there anyone on Zoom wishing to be recognized on Assembly Bill 466 at this time? I don't believe so. So with that, we'll go to audio broadcast services. Do we have anyone in support of Assembly Bill 466? If you'd like to testify in support of AB 466, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in support on AB 466. Thank you. Anyone in opposition, please? To testify in opposition oh, just a to AB 466. Just a moment. Do we have someone in the audience that wanted to speak? In support? Okay, go ahead and come forward. Welcome. Thank you. Thank We're you, so Madam used Chair. to going that way we forget. I, I apologize. <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you very much. Tanya Brown, advocates for the inmates and the innocent. Would you move the microphone closer to your face, please? Oops. Okay. How's that? That's much Sorry. better. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Um, Tanya Brown, advocates for the inmates and the innocent. Thank you, Madam Chair Carlton and the members of this committee. Uh, we are in strong support of this bill. Um, it's a long time coming and I just kind of want to touch on something personal being a having a loved one who uh, was incarcerated with Hep C. Back in 2005, he was to start treatment for his Hep C. However, he was transferred to another institution which delayed his Hep C treatment, which was the interferon, for two years. He was sent back to NNCC to begin the treatment. During the process, um, it had to stop. It was actually too late and they had to stop it. And what became of this, um, ultimately, um, he had come into the prison system in 1989. He had been wrongfully convicted. Just prior to his death, all the evidence, exculpatory evidence was found hiding in the Washoe County District Attorney's file on him. Judge um, Brent Adams ordered the District Attorney, Mr. Gamak, to turn over the file when it did all the evidence was discovered. As his attorneys were getting ready to file motions for new trial and bail, my brother, Mr. Klein, died for lack of medical care, lack of treatment for hep C. So 
I do not want another family to go through what we had done. If he had received the proper treatment and gotten the interferon and when he was supposed to, instead of the delays, the delays, then the delays, he would be alive today. So it's a long process and I still continue to exonerate his name. But yes, we are in strong support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you for being here this evening. So with that broadcast services, could we go to those in opposition on the phone line, please? To testify in opposition to AB 466, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in opposition to 466. Thank you very much. If we could go to those in neutral. To testify in neutral on AB 466, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is no one to testify in neutral on AB 466. Thank you very much. We'll go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 466. We will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 467. Thank you, Madam Chair. Assembly Bill 467 makes an appropriation from the general fund of $2,614,908 and an appropriation from the highway fund of $19,398,147 to the Department of Transportation for replacement of the Nevada shared radio system. Thank you very much. And do we have someone from the Department of Transportation available? Yes, good evening, Madam Chair. I'm Christina Swallow, the Director of the Nevada Department of Transportation. If you could just give us a brief overview on the shared radio system, just so that the committee is familiar with it, please. Yes, happy to do so. So the shared radio system is a public-private partnership with two other infrastructure owners, NV Energy, which maintains the system in Clark County, as well as other sites throughout the state, and Washoe County, which maintains the system in urban Washoe County. NDOT also maintains sites throughout the state focusing on roadways. Combined, the system has 113 sites and supports approximately 12,000 users, including state, federal, local government agencies who use the state, the system for emergency services and in support of their daily operations. The system also often provides coverage when and where cellular coverage is unavailable and supports other uh, NDOT devices such as our dynamic message signs, our road weather information systems, roadside emergency call boxes and chain control signs. The current radio system uses technology first implemented in the early 90s, which is no longer supported by the manufacturer and is approaching the maximum number of users and data devices that can be supported, even though the number of users continues to increase. The new system will, be, um, will meet all standards for digital radio communications uh, for use by federal, state, and local public safety organizations in North America. These standards enable um, interoperability communication between agencies and mutual aid response teams in emergencies. And uh, we appreciate your support in the past of this project and program. And um, I'm happy to answer any more questions, any questions you may have. And I have a couple of other experts on the, on the Zoom with me in case um, I can't answer your questions. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. So if I remember correctly, is this the second round of funding or the third round of funding towards completing this project? You asked one that I'm not going to be able to answer. So I'm going to turn over to Felicia Denny, our Assistant Director of, of Administration for that question. Thank you. Ms. Denny? Good afternoon, Felicia Denny, for the record. Uh, we started this project in 2019, and we did that via IFP. We also requested funding last biennium for 20 and 20 and the project is expected to continue through 2024. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure that I had the correct time frame um, in my notes. Thank you. We appreciate that. Any questions, committee members, at this time? Uh, Mr. Roberts? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, just a quick one, just so I understand. Um, why the balance? How do we determine how much comes out of the highway fund and how much comes out of general fund? Just, just kind of wondering why the why the balance is that way? Felicia, yeah. Hi, Felicia Denny for the record. 
when we started this project, uh, we were asked by the legislature via a um, letter to meet with LCB and the governor's finance office to come up with a methodology to ensure that we were fairly uh, supporting this with the correct funding. And so the formula we came up with is based upon usage, primarily for the infrastructure portion. And the latest usage figures for the highway fund were, uh, excuse me, oops, I don't have the latest, <laughs> but, but when we started, they were around 9010. And then we also based the subscriber equipment upon actual cost. That, that makes sense. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the, for the question. Thank you for the answer. And thank you. And if, if I remember correctly, some agencies, with, as, as they are general funded, would need to appropriate general funds. But others, since they're based, like our highway patrol, based in highway fund, then the dollars would come from that direction. So uh, are there any other questions from any committee members on that at this time? seeing any so with that this is the hearing on assembly bill 467 we'll go ahead and open it up if there is anyone on zoom that wish to testify on assembly bill 467 i don't believe so so we'll go to audio broadcast services if i could have those in support of assembly bill 467 to testify in support of AB 467, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in support of AB 467. If we could go to opposition, please. To testify in opposition to AB 467, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in opposition to AB 467. Thank you. If we could go to neutral. To testify in neutral on AB 467, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in neutral on AB 467. Thank you very much, Broadcast Services. We'll close the hearing on Assembly Bill 467, and we will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 468. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Assembly Bill 468 makes uh, various appropriations to the divisions within the Department of Motor Vehicles. The Division of Information Technology is requesting 23, uh, excuse me, this is general fund, uh, highway fund appropriations. Uh, the Division of Information Technology is requesting a highway fund appropriation of $23,677 for the replacement of the duo DigiPass security application and UPS battery backup units. The uh, Division of Information Technology is also requesting a highway fund appropriation of $645,078 for the replacement of computer hardware and software and associated equipment. The uh, Motor Vehicle Carrier Division uh, is seeking a highway fund appropriation of $38,916 for the replacement of computer hardware and software. The Division of Field Services is requesting a highway fund appropriation of $561,647 for the replacement of credit card readers, scanners, shredders, facsimile machines, and stylus marking systems. And the Division of Field Services is also requesting a highway fund appropriation of $61,614 for the replacement of barcode scanners. Finally, the Division of Field Services is uh, seeking a highway fund appropriation of $745,632 for the replacement of uh, computer hardware and software. The Division of Compliance Enforcement is seeking a highway fund appropriation of $51,000 $874 for the replacement of computer hardware and software. The Office of the Director is seeking a highway fund appropriation of $42,408 for the replacement of computer hardware and software. And the Administrative Services Division is seeking a highway fund appropriation of $46,880 for the replacement of computer hardware and software.
Okay, with that, committee members, are there any questions at this time? Good evening, Mr. Seaver. How are you? Nice to see you. Hi, Chair Carlton. Good to see you as well. Sean Sever from the DMV. Uh, thank you for hearing AB 468 tonight. And um, this bill just allows us to replace equipment that is at the end of its useful life and out of warranty, uh, which can affect our efficiency, which ultimately can affect our customer service. So we appreciate your time and can answer any questions. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, staff walk through every amount and everything that we've got. So I'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Uh, Assemblywoman Peters. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to ask a clarifying question. Um, are these costs only for the hardware and software or do these include costs related to IT efforts to get you your, um, to get these hardware and software set up and have folks get, um, get up to speed on them? Uh, yes, Sean Sever from the DMV. No, it does not in include that part. And it's not part of our transformation effort. This is just normal uh, maintenance. If I, I may, and you have enough IT staff and allocations to be able to get these hardware and software j set up and ready to go and, and implemented? Uh, Sean Sever from the DMV. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from any other committee members at this time? Not seeing any, okay. So with that, this is the hearing on Assembly Bill 468. We'll go ahead and open it up. Do we have anyone on Zoom wishing to testify on Assembly Bill 468? I don't believe so. So with that, we'll go to broadcast services. Do we have anyone uh, on the phone lines wishing to testify in support of AB 468? If you'd like to testify in support of AB 468, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair. There's no one to testify in support of AB 468. Thank you very much. Could we go to those in opposition, please? To testify in opposition to AB 468, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in opposition to AB 468. Open it up to neutral, please. To testify in neutral on AB 468, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in neutral on AB 468. Thank you very much. We'll close the hearing on AB 468 and open up the hearing on AB 469. Ms. Kaufman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. AB 469 provides a general fund appropriation of $549,998, which is a supplemental appropriation to the Office of the uh, Secretary of State for projected shortfalls related to credit card processing fees. Thank you very much. And we have someone from the Secretary of State's office. Good evening, Madam Secretary. Nice to see you and your team. Um, you came up a little short this time around. So <laughs> wanna, wanna give us a 30,000 foot view and we'll go from there. All right, thank you so much. And good evening, Chair Carlton and members of the Assembly Committee on Ways and Means. For the record, I am the Nevada Secretary of State, Barbara Sagaski. And joining me from Carson are Scott Anderson, my chief deputy. Deputy for commercial recording is Kimberly Perande. And deputy for elections is Mark Belashen. Deputy for operations is Debbie Bowman. And Sherry Hutter, our administrative service officer three is with us. So if you have questions, they are very talented. <laughs> And we are here this evening to present Assembly Bill 469, which makes an appropriation to the Office of the Secretary of State for projected shortfall related to the credit card processing fees. 
Madam Chair, as you and many of the committee members are well aware, credit card processing fees have been an issue since the state accepted credit cards for payment for state services. This year is no different, except that instead of using salary and other budget savings to cover the shortfall, as in years past, it's necessary for us to request this appropriation due to the pandemic related state of emergency, the increase of usage of online services due to the office closures, and the increased availability online services in the office. The estimation of credit card discount fees as we prepare this budget has always been difficult and we have done our best to account for the increased usage. But this year's usage has been even greater than we could have ever imagined. And regardless of our estimates, we are only allowed the base year allocations in our budget. So we are going to uh, have to ask to, for your help in this shortfall as credit card usage increases and the vendor fees also increase. We come before you this evening to request your approval of AB 469 to appropriate funds to this credit card processing fees that are a necessary cost of providing the filing services in our office. I wanna thank you all for your time and consideration this evening and my staff remains available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Credit card fees have been an elusive animal in this system for a while. Um, I'm not sure the public realizes there is a cost to the convenience and it's hard to peg it. So we go through this every couple of years trying to figure it out. Thank you very much. Committee members, uh, any questions of the Secretary of State on this particular item? Not seeing any. Thank you and your team for being here. We'll go ahead and open it up. Since this is the hearing on Assembly Bill 469, do we have anyone on Zoom wishing to testify, testify on 469? Not seeing anyone on Zoom wishing to be recognized. Broadcast services, if we could go to the audio, do we have anyone in support of AB 469? To testify in support of AB 469, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no one to testify in support of AB 469. Thank you very much. If we could go to those in opposition, please. To testify in opposition to AB 469, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is no one to testify in opposition to AB 469. And if we could go to those in neutral, please. To testify in neutral on AB 469, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in neutral on AB 469. Thank you very much. So that is the hearing on Assembly Bill 469. Madam Secretary, thank you and your team for being here this evening. I had hoped that you and I and the years we spent in this building could have got this thing straightened out, but we're just going to have to leave it for the next generation to fix. So with that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 469. And we move on, we'll move on to Assembly Bill 470. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Assembly Bill 470 makes a supplemental general fund appropriation of $481,920 to the Real Estate Division of the Department of uh, Business and Industry for a projected shortfall relating to timeshare filing fees. Thank you very much. So we have someone from the Real Estate Division available. So with that, committee members, uh, what I'll do is I'll go to them, and if you could just kind of give us a brief explanation of your shortfall, I think I can make a pretty good guess. But if you'd like to go ahead and put it on the record. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Sharad Chandra, Administrator for the Real Estate Division. Uh, again, this is for a um, $481,920,000 projected revenue shortfall. We've provided you with a high level exhibit for the committee just to review and kind of hopefully give you an idea of why we're here. 
uh, budget account 3823 is where the shortfall is, and this relies heavily on timeshare licenses and also timeshare filing fees. And with the shutdown and the uh, Vegas market that the timeshares rely heavily on, we've had a big, it has a big, a big impact on our revenue collection. Uh, we also have a quick revenue um, a comparison for year over year on those slides also that you have that shows you the kind of the big gap that we suffered. And so essentially we're here in front of you just to make sure that we get the appropriation to fill the gap and we anticipate a robust recovery with everything opening back up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, committee members. Are there any questions of Mr. Chandra at this time? Not seeing any questions. Excellent explanation. With that, we'll go ahead, and this is the hearing for Assembly Bill 470. We'll go ahead and open it up. Is there anyone on Zoom wishing to testify on Assembly Bill 470? Not seeing anyone wishing to be recognized. Broadcast services, if we could go to the phone lines. For those in support of Assembly Bill 470? To testify in support on AB 470, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in support on AB 470. And if we could go to those in opposition. To testify in opposition on AB Bill on AB 470, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in opposition to AB 470. And those that would be in neutral, please. To testify in neutral on AB 470, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in neutral on AB 470. Thank you very much. I don't believe we have anything else that we need on 470. Thank you very much to the division for being available this evening to answer our questions and give us the overview. We'll go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 470, and we will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 473. Thank you, Madam Chair. Assembly Bill 473 provides a general fund uh, supplemental appropriation of $500,000 to the Department of Corrections for an unanticipated shortfall related to inmate driven um, and food costs. Thank you very much. So with that, committee members, Department of Corrections came up short. Uh, with that, I believe we have someone with us. If we could get a high level overview for the bill, please. Chair Carlton, this is James Kendall Jones, Acting Deputy Director of Support Services for the record. Um, I'd like to let you know that the Nevada Department of Corrections is working along with the Governor's Finance Office staff on finalizing a supplemental money that should have a final number by the end of the week, depending on the calculation of supplemental that will be, it will be adjusted up or down. And this is due to some updated numbers through CARES Act uh, for the most um, fiscally prudent way of uh, addressing the shortfall. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, when we come up with a nice round number like this, I always tend to ask a few questions. You should have thrown an 11 cents in there and you probably would have had me hook, line and sinker. <laughs> um, so when do we think we'll have a final number? Uh, I've been told it will be by this week. I, I'm sorry, you broke up. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Chair Carlton. This is James Jones. For the record, I've been told it will be by the end of this week. We will have that number. Okay, thank you. So as soon as that's available, if you would make sure that you get it to our staff, so that they can provide it to us, so that when the t when the appropriate time comes, we have the most current number available. Okay, and if it goes uh, down, Carlton. that's fine. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> James Jones for the record. Yeah, so we'll get you that answer. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. So with that committee members, any questions? Assemblywoman Tolls. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And I have to confess when I first read this, I read it as inmate driven food costs, which may be 
the case, but I was just curious because <laughs> I have heard actually some concerns raised about um, some very various dietary needs and so forth. But could you elaborate a little bit more on what's inmate driven and then what the food costs are um, that we're taking a look at? Um, I can, sorry, James Jones for the record. Uh, the food costs, uh, food prices have gone up uh, significantly recently, which caused a shortfall. And as far as the other items uh, um, that are included in there, I do not have those in front of me. We'll get those. Um, Assemblywoman Tolls, we'll make sure that everyone has the uh, answers to that. And if you could please, Mr. Jones, if you haven't already sent it to our staff, please do, and we'll take it from there. Okay? Just need to have a complete record. Jim and believe me, I understand the, the food cost issue. So any other questions from any other committee members at this time? Not seeing any. So with that, this is the hearing for Assembly Bill 473. I'll go ahead and open it up. Is anyone on Zoom to testify on Assembly Bill 473? Not seeing anyone on Zoom wishing to be recognized, I'll go ahead and go to broadcast services. If we could open up the phone lines to those in support of Assembly Bill 473. If you would like to testify in support on AB 473, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in support on AB 473. If we could go to those in opposition. If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 473, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in opposition to AB 473. And neutral, please. To testify in neutral on AB 473, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in neutral on AB 473. Thank you very much. I don't believe we need to make any closing remarks. We have information coming to us to finalize the numbers on this, and then the committee will take it up then. So we'll go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 473, and we will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 474. Ms. Kaufman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Assembly Bill 474 provides a general fund appropriation of $17,472,208 for the continuation of the technology modernization project for the Child Support Enforcement uh, Program. It also authorizes uh, 34,316,000, dollars excuse me, $34,316,638 in non-general fund revenues, uh, again, for the support of the uh, Child Support Enforcement Program. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mr. Fisher and your team. Welcome to Ways and Means. So if you would just give us a high-level overview and a little bit of history on what you've done sure. and where you think you're going with this, that would be very helpful. Sure, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Steve Fisher. I serve as administrator for the Division of Welfare and Supportive Services. And I have with me this evening some experts that are here to answer any questions that I may not be able to answer. The funding for this particular uh, bill, it will be used to continue the replacement of our old, very old, antiquated, child support enforcement system, which was built on circa 1980 technology. It's very difficult to maintain, it's very difficult to use, so on and so forth. And uh, the program currently supports about 81,000 cases, over 120,000 children. This particular project was approved during the 2017 legislative session. It's a six and a half year project. We have completed all phases of the project through the development phase. Uh, this upcoming Monday, we will be starting the, what's called the user acceptance testing phase that will run through the month of October. And then in November, we roll the system out into production. So we rolled that into the production environment in about six months. So we're very excited about that. 
I'm also happy to report that this project is on time. It's within scope and we are certainly within budget. Um, and with that, uh, Madam Chair, I'll certainly open it up for any questions that the committee might have. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. It's nice to have some good news every once in a while when it comes to some of these projects. So with that, committee members, are there any questions of Mr. Fisher at this time? This one was started in 2017, and it looks like we're getting ready to round the curve on it. So no, seeing no questions. Thank you, Mr. Fisher and your team for being available. This is the hearing on Assembly Bill 474. So with that, I'll go ahead and open it up. Is there anyone on Zoom wishing to testify? on 474 I don't believe there's anyone wishing to be recognized on zoom so with that we'll go to broadcast services if you could open up the phone lines for those in support of 474 if you would like to testify in support of AB 474 please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue Caller with the last three digits, 226, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Karen Cliff, K-A-R-E-N, last name Cliff, C-L-I-F-F-E. On behalf of the Clark County District Attorney's Office, Family Support Division, calling in support of AB 474. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Assembly. The Clark County Family Support Division manages over 45,000 cases. We are currently in the testing phase, and I can testify with certainty this upgrade will positively impact both child support collections and lead to improved customer service. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Broadcast services, anyone else in support, please? Chair, there is no one else to testify in support on AB 474. Thank you. If we could go to those in opposition. To testify in opposition to AB 474, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is no one to testify in opposition to AB 474. Thank you very much. If we could go to those in neutral, please. If you would like to testify in neutral on AB 474, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is no one to testify in neutral on AB 474. Thank you very much. With that, we've had the hearing on Assembly Bill 474. I don't believe there are any closing comments. Thank you again, Mr. Fisher and your team for being available to us this evening. We will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 474. Thank you very much. So committee members, that takes care of the administration bills that we had listed for this evening. We will go back and now start working on some of the um, other bills that were referred to the committee. And as I said earlier, we're gonna hold 116 till the end. So we will go ahead and open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 192. Good evening, Assemblywoman Cohen. Welcome to the committee. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair uh, and committee. I'm Leslie Cohen representing Assembly District 29. Um, Assembly Bill 192 is a bill that came out of the interim committee on uh, health and human services. And with, with us on the Zoom to answer questions are Julia Peak, the deputy administrator of DHHS, and Elizabeth Kessler, the STD program manager for DPBH of DHHS. Um, so according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, Sexually transmitted diseases can cause pregnancy complications and result in serious consequences for both mothers and developing babies. In 2019, the CDC identified newborn deaths due to syphilis as, quote, the most alarming threat, end quote, and emphasized the need to test all pregnant women for syphilis in line with CDC recommendations. 
And this is especially important in Nevada because in 2018, we had the highest rates of primary and secondary syphilis in the nation. Um, we also had the second highest rates of congenital syphilis, and that's when a mother passes syphilis, with syphilis passes it along to the baby during pregnancy. Um, and the trends haven't been getting better for us over the last few years. According to the CDC, Nevada saw a 289% increase in congenital syphilis between 2015 and 2018. And, um, it, it's not just affecting us as far as the children being being ill, it's, it's financially impacting us. Uh, from 2015 to 2019, at UMC uh, approximately, or UMC accounted for half of the congenital syphilis births in Clark County, and um, they provided the, the um, subsequent treatment and oversight for the children that were born and their mothers. Uh, so if a child has physical deformities as a result of that condition, they're also going to require substantial treatment. And at UMC, that often means that we're covering that expense. Um, one article from the Infectious Diseases in Children um, publication found that compared with hospitalization for other conditions, infants hospitalized with congenital syphilis had longer average length of stay. And then also uh, the total... Um, charges for children with congenital syphilis related to hospitalization was was uh, more than doubled during the study period. Um, so the costs are just very extreme when when we're treating children with congenital syphilis. Um, and as I said, that can substantially affect a baby's health. It can cause miscarriage, stillborn birth, prematurity, low birth weight, or even death. And um, up to 40% of babies born to women with untreated syphilis may be stillborn or die from the infection as newborns. Congenital syphilis can also result in deformed bones, enlarged liver and spleen, brain and nerve problems, and just a host of other medical issues. Uh, but the good news is that both syphilis and congenital syphilis are pre preventable. Syphilis uh, can be cured with antibiotics and congenital syphilis can be treated. Uh, so, the key to treatment is, and prevention um, is ensuring that moms are tested for syphilis um, and receive prenatal care while moms are pregnant with these children. So that's where AB 192 comes in, which aims to align Nevada's STD testing requirements with CDC recommendations. And um, I'll also let you know that I did accept a conceptual amendment from the American College of Emergency uh, Physicians, the Nevada chapter. That's in section three, sub one. It's just adding the word willfully before violating so that the, the bill would read any person or entity willfully violating any of the provisions of NRS 442.01, et cetera will be assessed the civil penalty, um, which I unfortunately didn't have the opportunity to get the amendment ready, and I can address that later um, as the bill proceeds, but I did want to make sure that that was out there, that I had agreed to that with the American College of Emergency uh, Physicians Nevada chapter. Okay, thank you, Ms. Cohen. Um, doing amendments like this or is, is a little out of our world, but we know it, it does happen. So if you could please repeat that so that we have a clear record. You Sorry. said section three. Yes. So section three, sub one. Yes. And it's just adding the word willfully in the first line between entity and violating. And, and certainly if it's, if it's the committee's um, preference, I can work on that amendment as the bill, if the bill proceeds as the bill proceeds. We'll discuss that with staff and figure out the best path forward. We want to make it as clean as possible. So since you're here, uh, we can have we can continue to have that conversation. Uh, but we're here to talk about the dollars in the bill. And I believe uh, we received an email from Peb indicating that the bill would not have a fiscal impact. So we'd like Peb on the record if it's possible. They're available. And also, uh, we'd like to know and make sure that we're clear with Medicaid if, met, if there is a fiscal impact in the Medicaid budget. So, Peb, are you available? Mm 
No, I don't believe we have anyone from PEB available. We'll make sure to reach out and verify that email because we want to make sure that we have a clean record on that. So with that, do we have anyone from Medicaid available? Hi, good evening. My name is Erin Lynch. I'm the chief of our medical programs unit at the Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy. And yes, we have a fiscal impact of zero dollars for AB 192. And if you have any questions on, on about that, I can easily answer that too. Thank you. And have you submitted that in writing yet, please? It's in the fiscal notes. So it is zero? $0. Okay, we're just confirming to make sure. Okay. It, because yeah. it was amended, we know the original fiscal note, but once something's amended, we always want to verify with you that you're still in the same position. So, sure, Correct. Aaron Lynch, for the record, even with Amendment 1, we still have a $0 fiscal impact. Thank you very much for putting that on the record. So, committee members, do you have any questions of Ms. Cohen or the representative from Medicaid at this time? Not seeing any questions. Thank you very much, Assemblywoman. Excellent um, explanation of the bill and dealing with the fiscal notes. With that, do we have anyone on Zoom wishing to testify on Assembly Bill 192? Not seeing anyone wishing to be recognized on Zoom. I'll go to Broadcast Services. Do we have anyone on the phone lines wishing to testify? in support of Assembly Bill 192. To testify in support on AB 192, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 200, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Bradley Mayer, B-R-A-D-L-E-Y-M-A-Y-E-R for the record partner with our Jensen Partners testifying today on behalf of the Southern Health District. This bill is extremely important because Nevada ranks either one or two most of the time in syphilis and congenital syphilis cases. And so this bill was kind of came out of a visit from the CDC and some of their recommendations on what we can do to combat uh, the syphilis in Nevada. And so we urge your support of AB 192. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Broadcast services, if we could go to anyone else in support, please. Chair, there are no more callers in support on AB 192. Thank you. If we could go to those in opposition. To testify in opposition on AB 192, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is no one to testify in opposition to AB 192. If we could go to those in neutral, please. If you would like to testify in neutral on AB 192, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, nine, seven, eight. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Madam Chair, Joanna Jacob, J-O-A-N-N-A-J-A-C-O-B, Government Affairs Manager for Clark County. Um, Madam Chair, I just wanted to put on the record in neutral today that there is a fiscal note filed by Clark County for UMC on the costs of the test. Um, that does take into account that we can bill Medicaid for this cost. And this is a very important public health issue. We understand the importance of this issue. And as stated in the testimony by Assemblywoman Cohen, um, UMC does see a lot of these cases. It is, we are um, especially impacted because we have about 90% of our perinatal patients are Medicaid patients. Um, we will work with the state on this, Madam Chair. We will build private insurance for these costs where we can and try and work with the state on further mitigation of the cost to UMC. So I wanted to put that on the record here today and that we understand the important public health issues at hand. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jacobs. If you would stay on the line for a moment, please. Uh, Assemblywoman Tolls has a question. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And I did notice when reading through the fiscal notes for tonight that you had listed out the antibody tests at $25.55 for each. And I was just, um, I also noticed that uh, no other county had noted that. So have you conferred with the other counties as to why they, how they get theirs covered versus how Clark County, um, I know you mentioned a few different options that you would pursue, but I just, it, it just really struck me that there was only a fiscal note on your county listing out the cost for each of those tests and nowhere else. Madam Chair, through you to Assemblyman Tolls, Assemblywoman Tolls, um, Assemblywoman Tolls, I have not conferred with the other counties. So really, I think that the issue that you're seeing that Clark County is the one who filed the fiscal notes because we we are the only county um, that funds the public health, the public hospital in the state from UMC. They did a very detailed analysis of the cost of the test. So as as was testified um, in the hearing, um, there are some really impacts for the state, I guess, on the cost of a NICU baby. So we are doing this analysis. And so I have not conferred with the other counties, um, but that's why you see a, a fiscal impact from Clark County. We will probably find ways to build this into the budget for UMC. And that is why Clark County has filed the fiscal note. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair, for the question. question. You're welcome, Assemblywoman Tolls. Thank you, Ms. Jacobs, for staying on the line. Any other questions from any other committee members at this time? Not seeing any. Thank you very much, Ms. Jacobs. Broadcast services, is there anyone else in neutral on Assembly Bill 192? Chair, there's no one else to testify in neutral on AB 192. Thank you very much. So with that, this was the hearing on Assembly Bill 192. I don't believe we have any closing statements that need to be made. Thank you. Assemblywoman Cohen was shaking her head no. So with that, um, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 192. And we will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 315. And I believe we had Assemblyman O'Neill on Zoom. Good evening, Assemblyman. How are you? Having some technical problems, Chair, but I think I got it corrected now. Thank you. I'm sorry? I was having, can you, are you able to hear me? I'm having technical problems. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay. I thought, I, hopefully I got them solved. Thank you, Chair. Uh, would you like to give us a high-level overview of Assembly Bill 315? I would greatly appreciate it, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to you and to the committees. I'm here to discuss Assembly Bill 315. I apologize. I'm Assemblyman P.K. O'Neill, Assembly District 40, which encompasses all of Carson City and southeast part of Washoe County. As I said, I'm here to discuss AB 315. In short, it provides um, or requiring employing agencies of first responders, law enforcement, firefighters, and correctional officers to do two things. One, provide information at their place of employment on information dealing with mental health, post-traumatic stress, suicide prevention, mainly alcoholism, and then two, upon retirement within three months of retirement to provide uh, time with the mental health professional to dis discuss and deal with those same issues to recognize them. And so the retiring uh, first responders uh, can uh, hopefully enjoy the retirement in a much better manner. Um, I'd like to t say that um, I have no one else to support. I'm here to answer any questions in more detail. I do have a, a, a proposed amendment or for clarification purposes in regards to the bill, if I may go into that, Chair. 
And if we could, go, uh, let's go ahead and uh, talk about the fiscal note first, and then we'll go into um, the amendment. I see here in my notes that one of the fiscal notes provided by the Nevada System of Higher Education in an email to staff confirmed that the fiscal impact has been removed in the amended version of the bill. Is that your understanding also? Yes, it is, Chair. Okay, but the other fiscal notes that stand for the localities are all still current. Have you uh, been talking with them to see if there's a way for them to lower their notes, even though they don't impact general fund? We understand that. We still like to do our due diligence in working with the entities that are impacted by bills. Uh, first, I've also spoken with DPS. They should have withdrawn the Department of Public Safety. They should have withdrawn their note. Uh, do you have that on record? I don't believe I do. We may need them to send us something. I do have uh, Department of Public Safety cannot adequately determine a fiscal impact to the bill to the agency. The agency doesn't have sufficient evidence indicating how many retiring officers it would likely have to service to this bill. So we'll have to do a little more work on that. But if there is uh, something from them, if you can make sure that staff gets it, to attach to the bill so be. we have that information. Will do, Chair. I've got an email from them that I thought they also included to uh, that for you. Please send it I to us and we'll make sure we get it dealt with. If you have any issues, reach out to me. I'll make sure to uh, walk you through the system. So with that, uh, you had another amendment, Assemblyman? Yes, <clears throat> Chair. Um, I'm working with Clark County. Um, dealing with section one one b it authorizes the employer to make available to the police officer firefighter or correctional officer a peer support program which could be used to satisfy the two hours of mental health professionals as set forth in the bill additionally i wanted to find better the definition of police officer in section one uh, two dot c so that the bill will only apply to category one peace officers, those frontline officers that deal with the issues on a day to day situation. Uh, thank you. Some of the men, I won't get into a uh, policy debate with you, but we know technically in some areas, category one is not that much difference than category two. At times, they're riding in the same car with each other. So, um, well, I'll just leave it at that. I'll just leave it at that for the moment. But please do continue to work, and let us know uh, which direction you would like to proceed when we uh, when we get to that juncture. Uh, and make sure you send the other documents to us. So, committee members, at this time, um, does anyone have any questions for Assemblyman O'Neill on Assembly Bill three fifteen? Not seeing any questions from committee members. With that, this is the hearing on Assembly Bill 315, so we'll go ahead and open it up. Do we have anyone on Zoom wishing to testify on Assembly Bill 315? Seeing none, I'll go to Broadcast Services. Do we have anyone on the phone line wishing to testify on Assembly Bill 315? If you'd like to testify in support, of a on a b 315 please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue caller with the last three digits 689 please slowly state and spell your name for the record you will have two minutes and may begin good evening madam chairwoman and members of the committee for the record my name is tom t-o-m last name dunn d-u-n-n -N, representing the professional firefighters of nevada ab 492 from the 2019 session clarified under statute that ptsd is an occupational health and safety issue for public safety professionals it is important to ensure that those same professionals are made aware of the signs and services to address ptsd prior to their retirement since the last session in Nevada, there have been no less than five, fire, five firefighter and law enforcement officers in Nevada that have committed suicide. The fiscal cost of this bill is minuscule compared to the cost that is incurred by families, friends, and coworkers of public safety professionals who remain behind. 
We hope you will support AB 315. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Broadcast services, do we have anyone else in support of Assembly Bill 315? Caller with the last three digits, 747. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Chair and committee members, my name is Andrew Lee Pilbit, and I represent the combat wounded veterans in the state of Nevada of the military or the Purple Heart and the 65,000 disabled American veterans in Nevada, as well as I'm the current chair of the United Veterans Legislative Council, representing the 250,000 veterans and 500,000 Nevadans when you consider their families. We are in support of AB 315 and look forward to its improvements of the health and well-being of our firefighters, our police, and our prison guards. And we think this is an essential element that's long overdue to be added when we put these individuals in such difficult situations throughout their services to our communities. So we support AB 315. Thank you. Thank you very much. Broadcast services, anyone else in support of Assembly Bill 315, please? Chair, there is no one else to testify in support on AB 315. Thank you very much. Uh, those in opposition, please. To testify in opposition to AB 315, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is no one to testify in opposition to AB 315. Thank you very much. Anyone in neutral, please. To testify in neutral on AB 315, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 978, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Madam Chair, Joanna Jacob, J-O-A-N-N-A-J-A-C-O-B, Government Affairs Manager for Clark County. Again, good evening again, Madam Chair, to you and the committee. Um, I wanted to acknowledge the efforts of Assembly One Assemblyman O'Neill, he has been working with Clark County, as he stated, to try and get our heads around um, just the cost to providing these services. Um, we fund a share of Metro's costs, Madam Chair. We also fund Clark County Detention Center with the extent and Clark County Fire. So with the amendment in the Assembly to extend um, the scope of the bill to detention officers, which is the Assemblyman that intent we are revising our fiscal note uh, because it will cover the correctional officers at clark county detention center i believe that may have been emailed to your committee uh council madam chair but our original fiscal note was nine thousand dollars per each year of the biennium for fire um, we have revised that to forty six thousand eight hundred and thirty nine dollars per each year of the biennium and i will get that formally documented madam chair for purposes of your committee. We are, though, working with Assemblyman Neal on how to um, address these costs for the county. It is an important issue. We, we are in support of behavioral health services for our first responders, so we will continue to work with him, Madam Chair. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Jacobs. So I just want to make sure that I understood you correctly. So the original fiscal note for Clark County was $9,000, knowing full well that you do fund correctional officers, firefighters, and Metro, you have a portion. So am I to understand you that by combining all those different components, you're coming up with 46,839 in each year of the biennium? Is that correct? That's our, Madam Chair, Joanna Jacob, for the record. Um, sorry, I'm hearing some echo, um, but that is to the best of our ability, Madam Chair, based on our current estimates of rate of retirement and everything that we are trying to guesstimate, I guess, as we are compiling these fiscal notes. So we will continue to refine that um, as we continue to work with Assemblyman Neal O'Neill um, through the through the amendment process. But yes, that that is correct. That is what was given to me by our fiscal analyst, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And if you would continue to to look into that, I would view this as something that could be built into the uh, 
health insurance plan to be, and you are self-insured. So I believe this is on that behavioral health side, this is something that I would look in that direction to address since we've heard from other entities that they're rolling theirs back and or eliminating them. They figured out a way. So I'm sure Clark County is smart enough to figure out a way to handle it also. So thank you very much. And we look forward to getting uh, future numbers from you. Thank you. So with that committee members, uh, are there any questions at this time? So that was our one in neutral broadcast services. Do we have anyone else in neutral? Chair, there are no more callers in neutral on AB 315. Thank you very much. And thank you, Assemblyman O'Neill. Uh, that's the hearing on 315. Please continue to work on it. And I look forward to having a conversation with you in the near future on uh, what we need to do to address some of the issues in the bill. So thank you for presenting the bill this evening. And we'll move on from there. OK? Thank you. You take care. Thank you. See you tomorrow. So with that, committee members, <clears throat> excuse me, that closes the hearing on Assembly Bill 315. We will go to Assembly Bill 349, please. Mr. Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Howard Watts representing Assembly District 15. Uh, I'll just very briefly walk you through the provisions of AB 349 at a high level. The bill uh, makes several changes relating to vehicle emissions and our emissions programs. Uh, first, it uh, changes some of the requirements for certain types of classic vehicle plates in order to close loopholes where by uh, vehicles that are not uh, hobbyist or uh, special event vehicles have uh, gained these plates to avoid compliance with smog checks. Uh, so it creates a requirement for a specific classic vehicle insurance policy and clarifies the statute that these vehicles cannot be used for general transportation or commercial purposes. Uh, in addition, it makes uh, changes related to emissions technicians who currently have to uh, pay an additional fee for every location that they wish to work at. And this bill looks to uh, eliminate that so that once they are licensed once, uh, they have the ability to work at other locations without having to pay additional fees. Additionally, uh, it allows the Department of Motor Vehicles to uh, undertake a regulatory process to allow for a remote sensing option uh, for vehicle emissions uh, as an alternative to the current uh, emissions check station uh, where a company would set up uh, cameras that are capable of uh, detecting emissions and reading license plates and conducting the emissions process without having to uh, come into a smog check station. In addition, it changes from the current exemption of two years for a new vehicle before it has to uh, receive a smog check to three years since the failure rates of new vehicles um, for emissions checks are very low. And then uh, finally, it makes uh, some f adjustments to the fees related to uh, the emissions check program, one of which has not been uh, updated since it was first established in 1973, the other of uh, which has not been updated since uh, 2003. Uh, so some of these uh, uh, changes to the classic plate programs may come with some uh, additional compliance uh, changes from the department, but are also expected to bring in some additional revenue uh, from some of those smog related fees as uh, vehicles, uh, uh, potentially upwards of 20,000 that have been avoiding uh, smog checks are brought back into the system. Uh, some of the other components listed in the bill uh, may have some additional costs as well, but uh, those can, uh, I think, be offset by the fee adjustment and with that, I believe we have the Department of Motor Vehicles who is uh, able to speak more in depth to the, the uh, individual aspects of the fiscal note. 
uh, happy to answer any questions that you ha have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Watts. So I'm looking at the different fiscal notes, and it's nice to see them when they go to the positive side every once in a while. I think we've got a couple of those this year. So if I'm looking at all of this correctly, it appears as though there's estimates of a total $2.3 million in additional revenues generated in 22 and $4.8 million possibly generated in 23 and the cost or expenses uh, involved in uh, dealing th with this would be 5816 in 22 and 34686 in 23 dealing with regulations and adding a new position to verify the classic vehicle insurance endorsements. So uh, could, could you go over what the insurance endorsements are, please? Thank you for that question, Madam Chair. And uh, I'll, I'll give a brief answer and then may turn it over to Mr. Decker with the, the DMV to provide some additional clarity. So there are specific classic vehicle insurance policies. These policies uh, require things like an appraisal uh, to set a mutually agreed upon value of the vehicle, uh, uh, storage requirements, um, higher um, uh, enforcement of mileage standards, and essentially the, the benefit of those policies for true hobby vehicles that are being driven very rarely is um, that it ensures if anything happens um, when that vehicle is out uh, that it can get the, the coverage that it needs. And sometimes the premiums are actually less because they know the vehicle is being driven less, only being taken out for exhibitions uh, or, or uh, other occasions such as that. So, uh, you know, for most vehicles, the DMV just checks to make sure that there is proof of general coverage under the provisions of this bill in order to have three specific types, uh, subtypes of classic license plate. They would need to demonstrate that they have a policy that falls within this classic uh, vehicle insurance uh, category. And so the DMV would uh, need to do some additional work to make sure that they uh, have a, a policy that would be considered as, as classic. And with that, if, you have, if you'd like some additional clarity, I'd turn it over to uh, the DMV. Well, thank you very much. Thank I just you. wanted to understand the, uh, the general definition and, and purpose behind, behind that. So committee members, uh, questions of Mr. Watts at this time? Not seeing anyone, did you have anyone you wish to have present with you, Mr. Watts? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have anyone presenting with me. We do have Mr. Decker with the DMV who uh, can uh, provide any additional clarity that you'd like on the fiscal note. Uh, and I think we do have a couple of people that wish to offer some testimony and support. Okay, thank you. Mr. Decker, I do have a question, if I may. Um, You've piqued my curiosity on the remote emissions in a county over 100,000, a remote sensing system to test the emissions from a motor vehicle being operated on a highway. So I, I know we're getting a little off the fiscal side, but if we're gonna do something like that, I'm sure there's some equipment that's gonna be needed. So is there a cost involved in this? And what is the actual goal behind it? And will this system lead to uh, citations or will it just lead to folks getting registered the appropriate way? Madam, Madam Chair, J.D. Decker, for the record, DMV uh, Compliance Enforcement Division. It's an excellent question, I, I would say um, currently, the vendor, um, the, there are a couple of vendors that offer the remote sensing system. They own and operate the equipment. Um, currently, the idea is that they would set up their own equipment. Um, oftentimes, it's uh, mobile, portable, uh, but it can be permanently placed, um, that type of thing. Um, they set up the equipment and the equipment automatically reads the emissions of vehicles. Um, I, I believe that the idea currently in this bill is to enable the remote sense, sensing uh, system to um, augment or replace the current emissions testing um, that's done at, at an emissions station. So currently 
Um, if you live in Washoe or Clark County, every year you have to go down to an emission station um, and uh, receive a smog check. The remote sensing can read a vehicle as it passes by the equipment on the freeway. Um, the company theoretically would make uh, um, a return on their investment through notifying the DMV that a specific vehicle, uh, it, it, its plate was red, its emissions were red. Uh, that info was sent to the department and for a fee, the uh, operator or registered owner of the vehicle can um, pay a fee to the vendor and use that remote sensing data in lieu of the smog check. I have, and just to clarify, I have so many more questions, um, but they don't deal with the fiscal, so I will not take the committee's time on this one, uh, but I will have continued conversations with Mr. Watts and the proponents. Um, but I will ask again, though, we're talking about working with the company, we'll, so we will not be, uh, this will not be a state function. We will be subcontracting this out to another company to do just random smog tests. So is there a dollar amount involved with contracting with this company? Is it off to RFP? Where are we at in that system? JD Decker for the record. Madam Chair, to answer the question, uh, there would be no uh, cost to the state. There would be no contract to the state other than enabling um, the Department of Motor Vehicles to receive the data collected by, by the company. The uh, any uh, transaction, any monetary transaction would be between the vendor operating the equipment and the registered owner of the vehicle who may or may not choose to accept that, um, that remote fence smog check. Okay. Madam Chair, Mr. Mr. Decker, the last time I heard that line, it was all around red light cameras. So you might want to change your phraseology just a little bit. Um, just giving you a fair warning. So Mr. Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to add a little bit of additional clarification, the bill, uh, as it's currently written, is permissive, so it would allow the DMV to go through a regulatory process that would outline the framework of exactly how this program would work, what, uh, what costs, including any potential convenience fee, um, might be associated with it if it were to be stood up, and, and the intent is it would be an alternative, not a replacement to the current emissions check system. So um, it's, it's something that would then go through a, a process with the department to see, to determine if this is something uh, that they would like to move forward on, and if so, uh, how it would be structured. But yes, uh, as Mr. Decker noted, uh, the proponents have indicated that they would be providing the uh, equipment, so there would not be uh, additional upfront costs to the state in terms of that infrastructure, it would really be the process of, first of all, figuring out if they were going to move in this direction, uh, what it would look like, and then it, administering that and, and uh, compliance with it moving forward. And thank you very much, Mr. Watson. As I said, I have so many questions. But there to the policy side, I won't take the committee's time right now to, to dive into those. So we're, we're here basically to, to deal with the fiscal notes. Any other questions from any committee members at this time? Thank you very much, Mr. Decker, for being here this evening. We appreciate it. With that, uh, Mr. Kruger, were you presenting or are you in support? In support, so I'll go to in support in the room. Go ahead and come on up, Mr. Kruger. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Carlton. At this late hour, uh, I'll say that the I'm Peter Kruger representing the Nevada Emissions Testers Council, the men and women who perform in brick and mortar stations the uh, emissions tests that we all uh, uh, we all are at least in Clark and Washoe are subject to. Uh, as I say, we're in support, um, especially uh, two provisions uh, we can really get behind. Of course, is the classic car loophole. Uh, Mr. Watts has, I uh, think, found an excellent way to, to help solve that problem. And uh, in Section 10, the fees, as he testified, were in support of increasing those fees because they're outdated and uh, no longer uh, really represent um, the, uh, the industry and the cost. 
I, I will say uh, as a parting shot, uh, we'd love to talk about uh, remote sensing because our industry thinks that uh, we'll duke it out with those that want to offer that in regulation, but uh, we are in support of the bill, but uh, replacing uh, brick and mortar stations with uh, the, some gee whiz bang machinery that the wind can blow, the dust, and uh, we believe uh, is not accurate uh, in, in that sense. But we'll, we'll duke it that, that out, uh, Madam Chairman, in the appropriate place, and we are in support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kruger. So with that, I don't see anyone on Zoom wishing to be recognized at that time. At this time, so we will go to the phone lines. Do we have anyone on the phone in support of Assembly Bill 349? To testify in support of AB 349, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 725, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, this is Andrew McKay, A-N-D-R-E-W-M-A-C-K-A-Y. I'm the Executive Director of the Nevada Franchised Auto Dealers Association. I, uh, I know you have a bunch of work left to do, so I will be very brief. Uh, first, want to thank uh, Assemblyman Watts for uh, the work that he has put uh, in on this bill. Um, the changes are, to say they're uh, probably overdue, is an understatement. Um, with respect to the fees, and I think that's probably most appropriate on what we talked about, since this is the money committee, um, is Mr. Kruger uh, stated that this is this is true enough the fees. Uh, for something that are decades um, old and, uh, as Assemblyman Watts said, uh, one of them uh, hasn't been changed for over 40 years. Um, if the committee has any questions, uh, I'll avail uh, myself to answer them, but uh, just want to let everybody know that we fully support uh, AB 349 and, and thank the Assemblyman for all the hard work that he's done putting this together. Thank you, Mr. McKay. So, Broadcast Services, do we have anyone else in support, please? Caller with the last three digits, 514. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits, 514. Please press star six to unmute. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman and the members of the committee. My name is Ina Santiago, I-N-A-S space S-A-N-T-I-A-G-O, and I'm a volunteer with Chispa, Nevada. I'm here today to urge you to support Assembly Bill 349 to reduce smog pollution from vehicles. I'm worried about how air pollution is affecting our communities and uh, how we are living unhealthy air, are living with unhealthy air. And I'm especially worried about the impacts it has on our health from asthma, allergies, lung cancer to cardiovascular diseases. Just recently, Clark County received an F from the American Lung Association for our ozone pollution and was named 17th most polluted place to live in the country. This is especially bad for our older Nevadans and the children whose lungs are still developing, especially for the 54,484 children and 227,585 adults who have asthma in Nevada. The reports also found that the people of color are three times more likely to breathe the most polluted air than white people. And AB 349 is an important solution that would address the older, more polluting vehicles in our roads by closing the classic car loophole. And that would provide a pathway for low income communities who are most harmed by unhealthy air to access cleaner forms of transportation, either by repairing or replacing their vehicles with assistance from the county programs. This latter component is critical to make sure that we do not leave low-income Nevadans without transportation as we make sure cars on our roads can pass smog checks. The funding for these programs will come from the modest increase to the smog check fees to catch up with the inflation 
since they haven't been changed in many years. This bill has broad support from a range of groups, from public health organizations to business, to environmental groups, to county air quality and health departments. We hope you'll join thousands of Nevadans who are asking for cleaner air to breathe by supporting AB 349. And thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Um, broadcast services, anyone else in support? Chair, there are no more callers in support of AB 349. Thank you. Those in opposition, please. To testify in opposition to AB 349, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 672, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits, 672, please press star 6 to unmute. Chair, they seem to be having trouble. Let me try something real quick. Caller 672, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Chair and Committee for the record. My name is Joelle Gutman Dodson. J-O-E-L-L-E-G-U-T-M-A-N-D-O-D-S-O-N. -E -L -L -E -E and I'm representing the Washoe County Health District tonight, um, in, particular, in particular the Air Quality Division. We're in, we're in support of this bill and want to thank Assemblyman Watts for bringing this forward. We've been looking forward to a classic vehicle loophole revision bill for quite some time now, and we really appreciate the work he's done on this bill. We urge your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. So with that broadcast services, is there anyone in opposition? To testify in opposition on AB 349, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is no one to testify in opposition to AB 349. Thank you. And do we have anyone in neutral? To testify in neutral on AB 349, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is no one to testify in neutral on AB 349. Thank you very much. So with that, that is the hearing on Assembly Bill 349. I don't believe we would need any closing comments at this time. So we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 349, and we will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 357. Good evening, everyone. I have uh, Ms. Adair from the Attorney General's Office and former Speaker Buckley here with us for Assembly Bill 357. Um, it does have the Speaker's name on it, but I don't believe he will be involved. He was merely the vehicle to get this uh, bill where we are. So, ladies, if you would like to give us a, a high-level overview of what we're doing, and then we do have some questions that we'd like to address. So uh, whoever would like to go first. Thank you, Chair. Jessica Adair for the record. I am also joined on Zoom by our Chief Financial Officer, Jessica Hoban. Um, we appreciate you uh, and the committee hearing this bill. Very quickly, nearly 10 years ago, the AG's office reached several settlements with uh, perpetrators of the mortgage fraud crisis in 2008. 
Uh, at that time, then Attorney General Catherine Cortez Masto directed a small portion of that funding to be used in two ways. One, the creation of positions in the AG's office to investigate and prosecute consumer fraud, and two, a grant program to legal aid organizations that provide consumer protection legal assistance to low-income Nevadans. We all knew that there would be a time when this funding would deplete it, and that day is here, and it could not come at a worse time for our state. If a new mechanism isn't created to fund these positions, our office could lose 26 full-time positions dedicated to consumer protection efforts, including attorneys in the Bureau of Consumer Protection, uh, investigators and prosecutors uh, who are restricted to financial fraud, as well as constituent services staff. And legal aid organizations will lose millions of dollars in annual grant funding. AB 357 is our attempt to think outside of the box to uh, perpetuate this program with causing the least impact as possible to general fund. Uh, move, I wanted to thank LCB fiscal staff, specifically Ms. Kaufman and Ms. Waller, for working with us on some technical changes to the bill, and we did submit a conceptual amendment to LCB uh, last week. Uh, just very quickly, uh, generally, settlement funds it in this bill, uh, should it be passed, settlement funds uh, received by the Attorney General's office would be placed in a consumer protection administrative account. Uh, there would be some exceptions, such as restitution to victims and other recoveries. Uh, that consumer protection administrative account replaces the account already in existence for those purposes. And then the bulk of fu the funding and funds not used for administrative purposes would then be transferred from the consumer protection administrative account to the consumer protection legal account. The legal account funding would then be divided into two equal amounts. 50% would go to the Attorney General's office staff that work on consumer protection efforts and other consumer protection activities led by our office, such as public education. The other 50% would go to fund consumer protection efforts uh, by the three legal aid nonprofit organizations um, specified in the bill. And we that was another technical change that we submitted with the amendment. Um, those organizations are the Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada, Nevada Legal Services, and Washoe Legal Services. And the distribution in the bill reflects the current distribution of the Home Again funding. Simply put, this bill allows us to continue doing our jobs to ser serve Nevadans. No one else in this state investigates and prosecutes financial fraud or violations of our consumer protection laws like the AG's office. These lawsuits are what bring settlement funding to the state in the first place, and this bill preserves our ability to do our jobs and pay for those jobs. And no one else in the state provides legal assistance to low-income Nevadans on consumer protection issues like legal aid organizations. And I also wanted to thank Speaker Barbara Buckley, who is here on the Zoom, um, for her assistance on this bill. And I'm happy to answer any questions of the committee. And thank you very much, Ms. Adair. Um, Ms. Buckley, did you have anything that you would like to say? And then we do have some questions. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Barbara Buckley. I'm the Executive Director of Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada, the state's largest legal aid organization providing free legal assistance to those who cannot afford an attorney in civil cases. One of our largest programs at Legal Aid is our Consumer Protection Unit. In our system of law, the AG's office can prosecute cases and file actions against wrongdoers on behalf of the state, but it cannot represent individuals who are defrauded. And if you cannot afford to hire an attorney, especially when you've just been defrauded, that's where legal aid comes in. Without it, someone can lose their life savings, their home, their property, their shot at the American dream. A good example of this is guardianship fraud. I think most of uh, the committee members recall that a few years ago, we had predatory guardians stripping homes and life savings away from people in need. The Attorney General ultimately prosecuted a number of cases. Legal aid steps in to actually help remove the predatory guardian and help the protected person. 
As mentioned by the by Jessica, the Attorney General's Office, Legal Aid, our office, Washoe Legal Services, Nevada Legal Services, has had a strong partnership with the Attorney General's Office over the last 10 years. And we've been funded by the National Mortgage Settlement Dollars, which run out. Um, it is our hope um, that this legislature looks at this innovative proposal and funds it to ensure that consumer protection funding isn't stripped from the state at a time when it is needed the most. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Buckley. Nice to see you again. So, uh, yes, we do have a, a couple of questions and we appreciate the amendments that had uh, been presented. Um, a couple of the concerns that the committee has is the uh, access to the IFC contingency account for unforeseen expenditures. I believe the conversation in the bill around that was if there was not funding for staff, Ms. Adair, you had wanted to come to IFC for staff. That's something we typically don't do, usually with settlement funds. When the funds are no longer there, then the staff tends to go away, but we also know there's a rolling account for funds. So um, I'm not seeing in your amendment that being addressed. So if you could expand on that, please. Thank you, Chair. Jessica Adair for the record. Um, this is a very unique proposal, and it is unlike any other way that we fund staff in the state. Typically, we don't use settlement funds for staff at all, um, except in some rare circumstances. Um, so why it's important for us that we are able to come to IFC in an unexpected emergency shortfall, because the service that is provided by these positions is going to never go away. There will always be a need from our office, from the Bureau of Consumer Protection, to continue investigating and bringing lawsuits for violations of the Consumer Protection Act acts, um, in order to get the settlement funds. And there will always be a need to investigate and prosecute financial crimes. The local law enforcement agencies do not do perform this function. Uh, because of that, we believe it should be treated differently. Though I, I understand the committee committee's hesitation to allow the AG's office to come essentially, for lack of a better term, a bailout from IFC uh, because of the potential impact on general fund. I would say that the uh, impact of general fund for just using general funds to fund these positions would be significantly greater. Uh, but the main problem that we have here is that settlement funds are sporadic. We don't know when we will get them and we don't know how much. So we're gonna do our best, our absolute best to ensure that we don't have a shortfall. And you don't have to just take my word for it. We put into the conceptual amendment uh, number one, a requirement that the AG's office fund the staff first and foremost before spending it on any other purpose. And second, that if the AG's office wanted to spend settlement funds for any other purpose beyond staff, that it had to have 120 days in operating expenses in reserve. The other thing that we did in the bill is to ensure that those funds carry forward and don't revert to general fund at the end of the year. And the reason for that is that we can keep building up that, that um, account to make sure that we don't have to go to IFC in the future. But if 10, 15 years from now, we do a great job as a state and we don't have settlement funds because all of the companies here are doing a great job of protecting consumers and not violating consumer protection laws. We still want to be able to have some assurance for our staff that there is an option for us um, to continue to fund those positions because their uh, necessity will never end. That being said, we know that there is always the potential that we can be turned down. So if the AG's office has not been managing its mon money correctly, or frankly, the IFC does not have the money in the contingency account, even if uh, we had done a good job, we know that there's a possibility that the legislature could choose not to fund staff. 
I know that's a long explanation, uh, but it has been a hot topic. And frankly, we are fairly agnostic as to how the bill is written to allow the AG's office access to um, make an IFC request. Uh, but we thought that this was a good idea. Thank you, Ms. Adair. I'm gonna turn it over to Speaker Frierson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I realize this is somewhat different because the bill's in my name, uh, but I, I have made clear that the Attorney General and uh, the, the, quite frankly, generically, the legal aid community were doing the heavy lifting uh, because so much work has gone into this effort over the last couple of sessions. But I had the same question initially, uh, Madam Chair, that you had about uh, the unusual uh, mechanism, uh, but it became apparent to me, and I'm, this is a little bit long-winded, but I would like for Ms. Adair to correct me if my understanding is correct after talking that while the, the positions are being paid for with the settlement funds, the positions are being used to advance causes of consumer protection across the state regardless of the settlement funds. And so there would be a hole if those positions weren't, weren't uh, uh, if those positions went away, essentially. So I have two part question. That's the first one to make sure that I have it right, because I had the exact same question Madam Chair had. If you could answer that, Mr. Dare, and then I'll go on to my next question. Thank you, Speaker. Yes, uh, Jessica Dare, for the record. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, the specific positions that we're talking about are um, a couple of constituent services folks who answer calls and uh, complaints on scams and fraud, um, attorneys and legal support staff in our Bureau of Consumer Protection, and investigators and prosecutors who investigate and prosecute financial fraud. They are currently restricted to only do uh, working in areas of fraud right now, and they will be restricted in the future. So this would not be supporting um, other activities that are unrelated to fraud. Uh, but like you said, it is all for consumer protection efforts, not necessarily for consumer uh, related to one specific settlement. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And if I can uh, follow up, uh, you, uh, Mr. Dare, you addressed uh, kind of another point, and that was that we can always say no uh, as a legislature. Uh, but, but the other, the, and I apologize because we did talk extensively about this. This did not dawn on me when we talked. Uh, it also seems to me that uh, this would allow, if for whatever un, unexpected reason the funds ran out, uh, a little bit of transition time for the seeking of funds in an alternative way to be able to maintain these positions with, because as you stated, there's, uh, it's sporadic with respect to settlements. And so if there wasn't at least an option of buying some time, it wouldn't be indefinite, presumably, because you'd have to come back every time, but at least this would allow a little bit of time to transition to find alternate um, sources of funding or at least uh, reorganize so that you would be able to maintain the effort in, in consumer protection. And again, I apologize, we talked earlier, I didn't bring that up, but it just dawned on me just now. Thank you, Speaker. Jessica Adair, for the record. Yes, you're absolutely right. And what we didn't want to do is uh, put in our budget request uh, that we're going to need X amount of dollars in general fund just in case. Because number one, what if we didn't use it? Um, and didn't need it, that would mean that this legislature wouldn't have access to those dollars for other purposes. And uh, it, it, we just thought that that was a better use of general fund is just a, in a just in case circumstance, not in a year a biennial request to the governor's uh, in the governor's recommended budget for uh, general funds. And thank you, Ms. Adair. So you're talking about 26 positions you might possibly want to come to IFC to fill? What would the dollar amount on that be? Jessica Adair, for the record, I am going to pass that over to CFO Jessica Hoban. Uh, but I, I wanna be clear that we would not be asking IFC to fund all 26 positions at one time. What we would do is ensure that we have enough money to cover those positions and ask IFC for, um, if we just can't quite get there, 
for to close the gap until, like Speaker Frierson said, to buy us some time. Maybe there's another settlement on the horizon that we could um, that we can access, uh, and that's also why in the conceptual amendment we changed the transfer from the administrative fund to the legal. I'm sorry, the administrative account to the legal account to twice a year or as necessary in the discretion of the consumer advocate. So we didn't have funding just sitting there in that administrative account um, that we could not use. But if Jessica Hoban could answer the yearly or or biennial cost of those positions. Thank you. She, oh, there she is. I'm here. <laughs> yeah, just uh, takes a little maneuvering with uh, taking everything off of mute. Um, so to respond to the question about the 26 positions, um, using the basis of state fiscal year 21, which we're in right now, those 26 positions cumulatively have approximately $3 million per year in authority. Uh, for the uh, personnel costs in category one. Thank you. And I'm um, not sure who would like to answer this, but since the statement has been made that we feel that these positions are important and the work would be ongoing, what was the conversation about building these positions into the base in the future? Thank you, Speaker. Jessica Adair for the record. Um, we did that with the intention of not having an impact on general fund. Um, and because we think it's the appropriate use of settlement funds for the for the foreseeable future. Every single time I go before IFC and uh, with a work program to spend settlement funds, the first question I get from Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson is always the best one. And it's how does this relate to consumer protection? Um, this way, we know that all settlement funds in the future, uh, with, with the exceptions listed in the bill, will go to consumer protection um, and will be appropriately used for the, for the purpose of the settlement, um, regardless of the specific nature of, the, of that settlement. So um, while, while it would be um, lovely to to ask for a general fund every year for these positions and never have to worry about this um, settlement fund shortfall. Uh, we, we frankly thought it would, was the best use of, of settlement funds. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate and, that. And I, I appreciate that. But I also appreciate the fact that we don't come to IFC to backfill positions. So um, I guess my next question would be the uh, account that we're talking about uh, is proposed to stay outside of the budget system. It would stay outside of the executive budget account. Jessica Dare for the record, we the conceptual amendment that we submitted would um, change that. So it would stay in the state's accounting system. Okay, then I, I guess I misread it. I'll have to go back and read it again. It was my impression that the amendment didn't thoroughly address it coming all the way back. It still stayed as, uh, as an account in the executive budget, but outside of the system. So I'll, we'll have to look into that and, and verify that. But it is your intent that it would be within the system. Okay. Jessica Dare for the record. Yes, that is, that is our intention and I'm happy to work with you and LCB to ensure that that is reflected. Okay, thank you very much. We'll have you work with staff on that. So committee members, any other questions of Ms. Adair or uh, Ms. Buckley at this time? I don't believe we have any other questions. So with that, this is the hearing for Assembly Bill 357. We'll go ahead and open it up for support, opposition, and neutral. Do we have anyone in Zoom? On, oh, we have someone here in the room that would like to testify. Thank you, Chair. I'll keep it very quick. Bailey Bordelin, for the record. Um, I wanted to put on the record Washoe Legal Services support. The Executive Director, Dion Contine, could not be here tonight. but. 
Uh, this is really important funding for the work that we do at all of the providers that we have set up around the state with the legal aid providers to make sure that the needs are being met statewide uh, for the people in need for the needs of the time. So right now we're staffing up on foreclosures and bankruptcies um, and things related to the pandemic just as we did in the foreclosure crisis when this funding started. So uh, this is really critical in order for us to help people in need right now and uh, we would appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone on Zoom wishing to testify in support? Not seeing anyone wishing to be recognized? And let's go to the phones, please. Broadcast services, do we have anyone on the phone line wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 357? If you would like to testify in support on AB 357, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 402, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Um, good evening, Chair Carlson, <clears throat> excuse me, and members of the committee. My name is Connie Ackridge, C-O-N-N-I-E-A-K-R-I-D-G-E. I'm a partner with the Holland and Hart Law Firm. I'm appearing today as a member of the Nevada Access to Justice Commission in support of AB 357. The bill has the unanimous support of the Access to Justice Commission and its co-chairs, Chief Justice James Hardesty and Justice Chris Pickering. The Access to Justice Commission is part of its efforts to promote equal civil justice, supports the interest on lawyers' trust accounts, the IALTA program, which, which is provided for under the Nevada Supreme Court Rule 217. <clears throat> Excuse me. The IALTA program helps to fund Nevada's pro bono legal service providers I can tell you as president of the Nevada Bar Foundation, the State Bar, Nevada, State Bar of Nevada affiliated organization, which administers the granting of IOLTA dollars and other funds, including the mortgage settlement funds, that there are still many, many unmet legal needs in our state, including those of victims of consumer fraud. AB 57 is an important measure in creating additional resources for assisting these consumer fraud victims. The Access to Justice Commission and its co-chairs wish to thank Speaker Frierson, this committee, and Attorney General Ford for all your efforts in moving this bill forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else in support? Chair, sure. there are no more callers in support of AB 357. Thank you very much. Uh, those in opposition, please. To testify in opposition to AB 357, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is no one to testify in opposition to AB 357. Thank you. Uh, and those in neutral. To testify in neutral on AB 357, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers to testify in neutral on AB 357. Thank you very much. So I think we still have a couple of issues to address as far as access to the IFC contingency fund. The fund is basically for unforeseen expenditures and um, we're looking at this as this would be something to do uh, uh, fund ongoing costs. And when I read through the amendment, the purpose of the change is to keep the account in the state accounting system 
but as a non-executive budget account. So I believe that's the phrase that we're going to need to address between Ms. Adair uh, and staff to make sure that this account is in the, in the correct accounting system and within the executive budget so that it does have the uh, appropriate oversight that we can follow along with. So with that, we'll go ahead and have uh, the interested parties continue to work on this bill. And if you could share the, any further information with staff and myself, it would be greatly appreciated. So that was the hearing on 357. We will go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 357. And we will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 116. Good evening, Assemblywoman Nguyen. Welcome to Ways and Means. If you'd like to give us an overview of Assembly Bill 116, please. Good evening, Chair Carlton and members of the uh, Ways and Means Committee. For the record, I am Assemblywoman Rochelle Nguyen, representing Assembly District 10. It's my privilege to present Assembly Bill 116 for your consideration. For many of you, this might be your fifth time hearing a bill of this similar nature. Um, um, this bill seeks to decriminalize minor traffic infractions. Um, I would note just for the record that um, many of the fiscal notes were prepared prior to Amendment 311 to Assembly Bill 116. That came out of a lot of working groups and discussions um, prior to the presentation of Assembly Bill 116 in uh, Assembly Judiciary and also after that hearing. So I know that a lot of those fiscal notes um, are potentially addressed by those amendments because they were amendments made at the direction and the suggestion of many of the local um, and municipalities and county um, courts that had placed fiscal notes on those. So hopefully they will be able to make those clarifying remarks. I know that they have indicated to me in our conversations that they just haven't had time to get all of their county partners um, and online and figuring out what those impacts are. I would note that some of those fiscal impacts um, rely on the assumption that if criminal penalties for non-payment of traffic tickets are eliminated, for some reason, people will stop paying their entire traffic ticket. So I would just note that um, I think that's kind of some flawed logic. And additionally, each city and county assumed that non-criminal enforcement, again, would reduce compliance and therefore revenue from fines and fees fail to account for the amount they are currently spending on criminal enforcement. For example, the city of Las Vegas estimated a loss of around $3 million in warrant fees alone without any consideration for how that money spent issuing and enforcing those warrants and incarcerating those people might likely outweigh some of the collection in those warrant fees. Um, and with that, I am open for any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll go to Speaker Frierson first. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, thank you, Assemblywoman. You, you gave an example of, of, of the uh, municipality is not taking into account the, the cost of enforcement currently but and, and I'm asking you because I know you have experience in this area uh, is it your experience that many of these if they are arrested end up getting credit for time served and, and so my, my point is not only are we not getting money but we're actually paying money to house people for a weekend and we ultimately get nothing but that 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 expense Thank you for that question, um, Speaker Frierson. Um, that, that is correct. So none of these fiscal notes take into consideration this. If someone fails to pay their speeding ticket, it goes into a criminal bench warrant. That be bench warrant, they are later pulled over for that bench warrant for whatever reason. That person is then taken into custody. The police officer then has to impound their vehicle potentially, um, wait for a tow truck to come and impound that vehicle. They then have to take that individual down to the jail, book them into the jail. On average, people were spending approximately 72 hours in custody. I know we have heard from various folks, um, and I'm sure you have in this committee, how much it costs to potentially incarcerate someone in there. 
I've heard anywhere from $150 to $190 a day. And then in some jurisdictions, people are just given credit for time served. In some jurisdictions, you will see that there are people that are currently incarcerated. And it even says when you go to look them up on the public website, serve or pay. So they are unable to pay those like fines that sometimes can um, escalate and just compound. Um, when they're unable to pay those. And so they are serving time in our jails on those fines. And Ms. Nguyen, I, I think one of my questions is, and if I remember right, there is a jurisdiction in the state that is currently operating this way and there has been a cost savings to them. Am I correct or was that in another state? Was that here? There's plenty of um, actual evidence to show that there are cost savings and there is ability across the nation. I think we are one of, um, we are only one of like 10 or 11 states in the entire nation that have not decriminalized traffic. So we have plenty of other states to look at to see how they have accomplished this over the past like 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years in some cases. Um, here, one of the things that inspired me to bring up this legislation again is looking at what Carson City did. So they decided in October of 2019, kind of at the conclusion of the 80th session, that they saw the writing on the wall and they decided to um, not arrest and not um, send people, um, not to arrest on traffic warrants any longer. So they kind of did their own pseudo decriminalization. What they did instead was they would send out a notice and when that notice came in, they would then send the case to collections. Um, obviously, we have some kind of skewed data, data when it comes to how much um, impact that had because of COVID, there was already a decline in the number of tickets that were issued because there were fewer people driving. And there was a priority for most law enforcement not to pull people over unnecessarily for traffic citations. Um, but even then, they said with their collections, not necessarily their warrants, I believe they saw an increase of around eight or eight and a half percent in their collection um, things. So I think that's some in inspiring, it was inspiring enough data that it encouraged me to bring up Assembly Bill 116 during this session. Okay, thank you very much. So we do have a couple of uh, fiscal notes listed and the first one that I come to that actually has some dollars on it, I do have a couple with zeros on them, is the Department of Public Safety and it appears as though between 22 and 23, they were, they're looking at 310,000 and 80,000 into the future. So I'm assuming the 310,000 is to set up a new record management system to change their systems around and then in the future, it would be $80,000. Have you had conversations with the Depar uh, Office of Tra Traffic Safety in DPS about their fiscal note? I have, Rochelle Wynn for the record, I have had conversations with them. If anything, they're probably is the most like um, realistic because it doesn't have anything to do with their ability to do their job. I know that they would have to potentially do new ticket forms. I learned that um, there are still a lot of officers that actually use ticket books. So that might require the reprinting of new like ticket books. In fact, I think it's like 60% of our state actually uses those carbon copy type of, of things. I know that there were provisions in this bill that we um, included to actually make collection easier and to save our court system um, some additional like resources. Um, for example, one of the amendments allows for an opt-in opportunity for people to receive their notification or reminder via either text message or email, which would save a lot of money for the jurisdictions and not having to do that. And it's also been one of those things that have been shown to actually encourage people to pay their tickets because sometimes getting a text reminder is going to be more accurate and more remind people to pay their tickets rather than receiving any kind of certified letter or something to an address that may have changed. Okay, thank you very much. Committee members, any questions of Assemblywoman Nguyen at this time? Not seeing any, do you have anyone else that you would like to present with you this evening on this issue? I don't think I have anyone to present, but I do know there are several people probably here to testify in support. 
Okay, so with that, I'll go to, this is the hearing for Assembly Bill 116. So I will go ahead and go to Zoom. Is there anyone on Zoom wishing to testify in support of AB 116? Not seeing anyone in, wishing to be recognized on Zoom. Broadcast services, are, is there anyone here in the room wishing to testify in support of AB 116? Please come forward. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. John Pirro from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. Uh, we're urging this committee to support AB 116. Nevada, as Assemblywoman Rochella said, is one of the few states to continue to criminalize traffic offenses. We're building systems off of criminalizing traffic offenses that disproportionately affect our most marginalized citizens. The fiscal notes don't take into account the cost of incarcerating somebody in our Clark County Detention Center at $190 a day. And I believe that they came before this body earlier in the session to ask for $200 a day state reimbursement. So the cost is going up. If you get arrested on a Thursday in municipal court, you will not see a judge until Monday. So we pay that. And as Speaker Frierson has said, that's three days at $190 a day that the state eats. So that's not included in the fiscal note calculation. They don't take into account Carson City's lived experience during this pandemic where they actually saw an increase in revenue and collections when they stopped arresting people for warrants for traffic tickets. They also don't take into account the ripple effects that I as a public defender have seen while representing people at bench warrant clinics. I watch people just from a simple warrant get arrested on a Thursday, not released till Monday, lose their house, lose their car, lose their job, and then struggle to get back on their feet. None of the fiscal notes take into account that economic impact that it has on the citizens of our state. AB 116 is not only good public policy, but in the long run, it'll be good fiscal policy. So I urge this committee to pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Others in support in the room? Good evening. Good evening, Chair Carlson, members of the committee. This is Kendra Burchie, K-E-N-D-R-A-B-E-R-T-S-C-H-Y with the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. I echo Mr. Pirro's statements and urge this committee to support this measure. I would note that it is absolutely, there's an economic impact on our citizens because they are not losing their jobs by being picked up and kept in custody for several days. They're not losing their children and um, being involved in the CPS system because of these tickets. In Washoe County, it costs approximately $129, up to $500 per day for someone to remain in custody. And for those of you who do not serve on the Judiciary Committee, I would just add that each misdemeanor is punishable of up to six months in the Washoe County Jail or the jail of that jurisdiction and potentially a fine and potentially being placed on probation. I have unfortunately seen individuals who have been placed for the entire six months in the Washoe County Jail for traffic tickets. So we do believe that this is fiscally sound and urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the room wishing to testify in support? Not seeing anyone else, broadcast services, if we could go to the phone lines to, t to those who would be in support of AB 116. If you would like to testify in support of AB 116, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 725, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller 725, you are unmuted on our end. Is it possible your phone is muted? Oh, I got it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair Carlton and committee members. This is Nick Shepak, N-I-C-K-S-H-E-P-A-C-K, -E Policy and Program Associate with the ACLU of Nevada. None of the fiscal notes consider the savings from ending criminal enforcement. The fiscal notes assume criminal penalties are effective enforcement mechanisms, but ignore the fact that the current process is not working, hence the hundreds of thousands of cases of non-payment. And they cannot know how effective their enforcement mechanisms are without disclosing how much they are imposing, collecting, and failing to collect. The fiscal notes rely on the assumption that if criminal penalties for non-payment of traffic tickets are eliminated, people will stop paying. This is uh, 
There is ample evidence to indicate that people don't pay because they can't afford to. With the exception of one person, everyone interviewed in the new ACLU report, which has been submitted to the committee, failed to pay their fines and fees because they could not afford to pay them. Each city and county that assumed no criminal enforcement would reduce compliance and therefore revenue from fines and fees failed to account for the amount that they currently spend on criminal enforcement. As mentioned by the sponsor, the city of Las Vegas has estimated a loss of around $3 million in warrant fees alone without any consideration for the amount of money spent issuing and enforcing warrants, which very likely outweighs the amount collected in warrant fees. We are deeply concerned by any government entity that argues for the need to wield the power of the criminal legal system in order to collect revenue when there is no legitimate public safety argument. Courts and law enforcement should not be shaking down people for revenue. This is taxation by citation, plain and simple. We thank you for your time and for hearing this bill last, so I was able to watch the Cardinals game. Have a great evening. Could have gone all night without that one. <laughs> You're talking to a Cardinals fan. Thank you very much. I, that will not reflect on the bill hearing, I promise everyone. I'll try to keep that outside of my, my thought process. So with that, uh, broadcast services, is, are there anyone else in support of the bill? Caller with the last three digits, 050. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller 050. Please press star six to unmute. Good evening. Please continue. Hello? Hi. Um, yes, uh, thank the uh, committee for um, addressing AB 116. And uh, I'm Donald. Gallimore Sr., D-O-N-A-L-D-G-A-L-L-I-M-R-E, uh, the Legislative Committee Chair for the Reno Sparks NA NAACP. And the Reno Sparks NAACP is in strong support of AB 116 to make traffic stop, uh, ticket stop civil penalties only, place misdemeanors on vehicle uh, violations, and include Section 80 to... Um, pretty much discontinue prosecuting citizens who are arrested uh, and, uh, you know, catch cases that will be rescinded after the law is passed. So uh, I would like to uh, please uh, also make sure that everyone understands that police officers, uh, peace officers, as well as citizens can uh, say uh, we can save their lives with this passage because of the uh, much more comfort in traffic stops. So, uh, it, it, uh, by the way, expenses for incarceration um, will uh, drop, basically, because of the uh, civil penalties uh, fees. So uh, I just uh, request that the committee please pass AB 116 to save peace officer and citizen lives. Thank you very much. Uh, other folks in support broadcast services? Caller with the last three digits, 533. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Madam Chair and committee members. This is Lisa Mosley. I am the Nevada State Director for the Fines and Fees Justice Center. We are a national organization that works to eliminate fees associated with the criminal justice system and to make fines more just, equitable and just. We are in support of this bill, and we want to thank Assemblywoman Wynn for sponsoring this important piece of legislation. As you, has already been mentioned, Nevada is only one of 13 states that still treat minor traffic violations as a criminal offense rather than a civil infraction. And this is counterproductive for a few reasons. One reason is that we can point to our own city of Carson City. You've heard about Carson City. And when they stopped issuing warrants, their collection rate went up by 8.5%. But what we did not hear about Carson City is of the cases that they had actually turned over to collections agencies, they saw an increase in collection rates of 50% in those cases. You've also heard about how much it costs to incarcerate someone and how much 
money can be credited to a person, with, which means actual revenue to the state is not being seen. Another issue is that officer salary, what it costs an officer, a Metro police officer, to arrest someone, tow their car, transport and book them in jail is anywhere from $145 to $164 per day. And that information comes from our Metropolitan Police Department. That is money, that is officer's time that could actually be used to be getting dangerous criminals off the street. So again, we believe that this current policy is counterproductive. We urge the committee to pass this legislation. And again, we want to thank Assemblywoman Rochelle Wynn for bringing this important piece of legislation. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Broadcast services, is there anyone else in support? Caller with the last three digits, six, four, seven. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Marcos Lopez, Americas for Prosperity Nevada, M-A-R-C-O-S-L-O-P-E-Z. Americas for Prosperity Nevada is proud to support AB 116, and we thank the sponsor for bringing this forward. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I'm just going to say mainly ditto. Uh, but I think uh, we should be looking at completely different ways of funding our courts. So we would go one step further. We think that the entire judicial system needs to be funded from the general fund wholly, not on the backs of Nevada. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the ditto. Anybody behind him, please take note. So with that, uh, the next person in support. Chair, there are no more callers in support of AB 116. Thank you very much. We'll go to opposition. To testify in opposition to AB 116, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 620. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Mike Cathcart, C-A-T-H-C-A-R-T, representing the city of Henderson. I am in opposition this evening specifically for the fiscal note that was filed by the city, but we are continuing to participate in the ongoing discussions with the sponsor to address the policy concerns. The city's fiscal note is purely based on financial concerns and is not meant to impact the ongoing policy discussions. However, the figures that were submitted are, in our view, the actual cost for the city if this legislation were to pass. The city's fiscal note is based on two issues, um, and, and one of those is not the collection issue. First, the implementation costs of the civil process. The implementation costs would include personnel, technology updates, because like the Department of Public Safety, we will have to upgrade our systems, professional services, and training related to converting the court's handling of traffic citations from misdemeanors to civil infractions. We believe the first year would be approximately 700000 in implementation costs related to the conversion, and that there would be some recurring costs in future fiscal years. And then second, the warrant revenue that is currently collected would no longer be assessed, and that revenue is approximately 250000 per year starting in the 2022-2023 fiscal year. The warrant revenue is an important part of this policy discussion, and if this legislation passes, the revenue simply will now no longer be collected and is therefore a financial impact that we we felt must be documented when we were asked to provide fiscal information on this legislation. There may be some savings as discussed by the committee earlier, um, having to do with the warrants, but I do not have that number at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, broadcast services, I have someone on Zoom wishing to testify, so I'm gonna switch over to Zoom. Mr. McCormick, did you have a uh, testimony in opposition? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, John Cormick, uh, for the record, I'm the Assistant Court Administrator at the Supreme Court AOC, and with me is Todd Myler, who is our Manager of Budgets here. Uh, first, I'd like to indicate that as far as the policy question, we are neutral. However, um, as I think neutral with concerns has fallen out of disfavor, I, I did sign up in opposition uh, simply to point out 
<clears throat> that the current funding scheme uh, for the Supreme Court funds approximately one third of our operating budget with administrative assessment revenue that is levied on misdemeanor violations, 80% of those primarily being traffic tickets. And as our fiscal note indicates, we don't have a way to necessarily predict the impact this measure could have on that uh, funding. However, we feel it would. Um, uh, and additionally, um, I would just like to point out, we, we've conducted some analysis of uh, Carson City administrative assessment revenue um, as submitted to the state over the past few months. And, and, and while the sample size is probably not sufficient, we've not seen necessarily uh, any substantive increase in, in their collections. Thank you. So with that broadcast services, if we could go ahead and go back to the phone lines to the next person in opposition, please. Caller with the last three digits, 294. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Madam Chair and members of the committee, for the record, Callie Wilsey with the City of Reno. That's C-A-L-L-I-W-I-L-S as in Sam E-Y. We are here in opposition to AB 116 this evening, strictly because of the fiscal impact to the bill. We wanted to put on the record revisions to our fiscal note under the reprinted version and based on conversations we've had with the bill sponsor thus far. Since its introduction, the bill has made several changes, including allowing the fees from the civil citations to stay in the jurisdiction in which the infraction occurred. Additionally, provisions that the bill sponsor mentioned, such as allowing to collect certain contact information and allowing for a text option will provide additional tools we believe will aid in the collection process. We believe it's important to keep certain enforcement tools in place to reduce the fiscal impact of the policy effort. Based on these factors, we have revised our annual revenue losses that were represented in the original fiscal note downward to approximately $80,000 to $100,000. The initial cost to transition to our system uh, would still be estimated at approximately $200,000 for that one-time cost. While the changes to the Bill of Health alleviate some fiscal concerns, it continues to create an unfunded mandate on local governments. Uh, for that reason, we're in opposition this evening. We want to thank Assemblywoman Wynn for her efforts so far in this bill and appreciate the opportunity to continue to work with her on the implementation aspect of the policy effort. Thank you for the opportunity to put this information on the record this evening. And thank you very much. And if you could send us that information, please, that would be very helpful. If not, she may have hung up. We may have to reach out and get that information. So with that, broadcast services, if we could go to the next person in opposition, please. Caller with the last three digits, 642. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the committee for the record, Randy Robinson on behalf of the City of Las Vegas. That's uh, R A N D Y R O B I S O N. Uh, I appreciate the comments from a couple of my colleagues from Henderson and Reno. We would echo those in terms of our opposition tonight, uh, strictly related to the fiscal portion of this bill. Uh, we've been working uh, with the sponsor on the policy side and, and uh, uh, support the support the policy of this bill. Um, there will be uh, costs uh, incurred by us, uh, not only through loss of revenue, um, but by changing our, our court management fee. Will there be cost savings? Absolutely. Um, do we think there'll be a wash one for one? Um, no, we don't. Uh, but what we have done at the, at the encouragement of the sponsor is uh, reached out to the city of Phoenix, who has been doing uh, a similar program for over 25 years. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time with them learn how they're doing it, learn what they're doing, um, and the costs uh, and cost savings that they've experienced uh, and the, the changes that they have made over the last 20 plus years, as well as the changes that they continue to make to refine the system. Have they seen an increase in, uh, in collections because of the way that they handle uh, this, this kind of a program? Yes, they have. And we anticipate that when uh, uh, we implement this system here, uh, should the bill ultimately pass and we follow a Phoenix type model, we, we anticipate that the collection will increase for us as well. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, we don't have a way to, to accurately uh, uh, estimate 
uh, what the cost savings will be, what what the cost uh, um, will be, what the loss of revenue will be. As the bill continues to change, uh, we're we're doing our best to try to keep up and, and make those estimates, so that uh, hopefully at some point we can provide a reasonable estimate to the committee. Um, uh, we, the, I guess, the way I've always understood a, a fiscal note uh, was that uh, the legislature was inter interested in in what costs uh, uh, may occur as a result of legislation. So that's that's why we submitted the, the fiscal notes the way they are. Uh, we had to respond to the original bill. Uh, now it has changed. We're trying to respond to those changes as well. So, thank you for the opportunity to, to uh, uh, offer those comments tonight, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, the next person in opposition, please. Caller with the last three digits, 241. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Chair Carlton, members of the Assembly Ways and Means Committee. My name is Alex Ortiz, A-L-E-X-O-R-T-I-Z, representing Clark County. Clark County opposes AB 116 as written and amended, not due to the policy issues that have been discussed, but the fiscal impact to Clark County. We want to thank Assemblywoman Nguyen for working with us these past few months, listening to our concerns, and addressing most of them. I really appreciate her efforts assembling the new stakeholder work groups and getting us to this point. The fiscal note analysis was developed by our justice courts and is based on the original bill, not the bill as amended in its first reprint. Some of the sections of the bill that have a fiscal impact on the county are sections 30, 31, and 34. We will continue to work with the assemblywoman to ensure the fiscal impacts to the county are mitigated. And if they are, we will gladly move to the neutral position. Additionally, it is important to us and the assemblywoman has confirmed the acceptance of the latest amendments to section 27 from Carson City, which removes the person's social security number from the civil infraction citation. Once again, I wanna thank the assemblywoman for meeting with us and keeping the conversation going on this important issue. Thank you, Chair and committee members for your time tonight. The next person in opposition, please. Call it with the last three digits, 863. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Dagny Stapleton, D-A-G-N-Y-S-T-A-P-L-E-T-O-N, Executive Director of NACO, the Nevada Association of Counties. Um, we wanted to provide information on the record on the counties outside of Clark who submitted fiscal notes. Uh, we want to thank the sponsor for working with us on this bill, specifically the language in Section 34, which ensures that the new civil penalties will accrue to the counties, as this is a critical funding stream uh, for our court system, as you've heard from others. I can confirm, uh, as the Assemblywoman stated, that the uh, rural counties with fiscal notes on the bill did put those in prior uh, to the bill being amended, and they are in the process of adjusting those. Uh, those should be reduced, uh, some substantially. However, we are not sure at this point whether the notes will be removed entirely. Um, we will continue to work with the Assemblywoman on that and on any continuing fiscal impact. Again, we thank her for all of her work on this bill and her willingness to coordinate uh, and meet with us on it. Thank you. Thank you. The next caller, please. Chair, there are no more callers in opposition to AB 116. Thank you very much, Broadcast Services. Do we have anyone in neutral? Anyone wishing to testify in neutral on AB 116, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral on AB 116. Thank you very much. Uh, Assemblywoman Nguyen, did you have any closing comments? Thank you. Assemblywoman Rochelle Wynn for the record. Um, I will continue to work with them. I know that since the amendment came out a couple of weeks ago, um, obviously people have not had the ability to um, update any of their fiscal things. So I will follow up so they can make sure they get that information to the committee. Thank you very much. And if we could get that as, as soon as possible, we, we did wait a while in having the hearing on this bill so that we could give folks time to analyze the amendment and the, this reprint and where their fiscal notes might be. So 
I'd like to incentivize them all to get it finalized in the very near future so we can have that information as we move forward. Thank and you. Rochelle, and for the record, just for the record, I did accept almost every single one of the amendments from the municipalities and counties. I know that there were some that slipped through um, in the amendment as it was like drafted, um, but it is my intention as this bill moves forward to make those additional changes as well. Thank you very much. So with that committee members, not seeing any other questions or comments, this was the hearing on Assembly Bill 116. I will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 116. And that is our last bill for the evening. We won't, uh, there are a couple of bills that we could move, but we're missing a couple of members. So committee members, uh, when we get the chance to get back together, some of the uh, administration bills we're gonna wanna move out and get to the floor as we move forward. So with that, the last thing on our agenda this evening is public comment. Broadcast services, do we have anyone on the line for public comment? If you would like to make public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there was no one on the line to make public comment at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, committee. It was a long evening, but we did get a lot done. The more we do now, the easier it'll be towards the end. I appreciate it. Broadcast services, thank you all very much for hanging tough with us this evening. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>